we did that tour. We were opening for, for Tom Petty, um, playing all these you know big stadiums, arenas, and types types of gigs. You know, and uh, uh, we were doing like an opening slot. We go on stage at seven thirty, play for forty five minutes. And we were on the bus to the next gig at about nine o'clock. You know, we had to make. I remember we had a band meeting to decide what night we were going to stay behind and actually watch Tom Petty play. Right, but those guys were very cool. The Tom Petty guys were so cool. They they were, they would come out and, and hang at the catering with us and talk to us. I remember Mike Campbell was very cool. He was he came up to me like one of the first nights. He was like, "Dude, that Gold Tap Les Paul you're playing is the sound of rock and roll." He was like, really cool. And those, the only person we never saw from that group was Tom Tom himself. He would never come out. He would hide somewhere, and you'd never even see see him until like one second before they walk on stage. I don't know what he was doing, but he, like all the other cats were very social and coming around. I got to be really good friends with like Ron Blair and you know all all the guys that were. And I've known Steve Froney for a long time. I was actually the first guy to hire Steve Froney on a Nashville session when I was producing a record years ago. So I knew the, some of the cats, you know, but they're great guys, man. Uh, you know, just super sweet. Ben Tench is a really sweet guy, and those are just good guys, you know. Was that Tom's last tour? Yeah. That was the end of it. You think that's why he was hiding off somewhere? Yeah, I know. I heard that he was in great pain with his hip. His hip was in really bad shape. And uh, I know he was on a fine concoction of uh, different drugs, you know, to sort of deal with that. But they were doing these long shows. It was like these two two hour plus shows. And he would just sort of stand there and wouldn't really move, you know, but I could tell he was in a lot of pain, you know. But uh, man, they had it made. They were. On that tour, 2017, they had set up a hub in Chicago. I think it was Chicago. So they had, they hubbed out of Chicago for every gig of the tour. So they would just get on a plane, dressed for the gig already, fly, have catering, and then just chill and then go on stage. So they were already dressed when they got to the gig. You know, they were looking cool when they, when they got there and they'd have catering and they would hang out with us and, you know, Good guys, man. I, I'd love to see Mike Campbell again. You know, I, I, I'd love to chat it up with him. And he was, we, we got to talking quite a bit on that tour. You know how it is on a tour. You just sort of, night after night, you just sort of, you know, get to know guys a little bit. But I mainly talk to him about about records, you know. That's what I like to talk to guys about, you know, like, I remember asking him. People know me as a question guy because I ask a lot of questions. I love to get a party started by sort of, going around the room and sort of, you know, asking people like provocative questions that sort of gets the room buzzing and talking, you know, I, I've been doing that for a long time. People know that I'm, that I do that and it's like a thing with me, you know. But I, I, I'm gen I'm not doing it for a joke or anything. I'm just genuinely curious. Like, I mean, I'm like, I really want to know, like human nature is the only thing that I'm interested in besides music. I'm fascinated with why humans act and do the things that they do. I'm like really fascinated with that. And I'm studying people and I'm studying the way they act and the way they do things. And, and I love to, to study human nature and that question thing is part of that. I, I was thinking about this time when I asked Mike, because um, as a session player, there's a drug that happens on a session that's better than any drug that you could, like a real drug that you could ever take. And man, once you get a taste of it, you want it the rest of your life. And it's like, I call it the magic overdub. When you, when you make a nice track, right? A nice bed track that sounds cool, but it's missing a couple of things. Man, if you come up with, there's this thing that happens if you get lucky and you find the part and the tone or whatever it is, you know, if you find the fucking magic overdub that just, makes the track blow open and come alive. You can't always do it, but when you do it, everybody knows it, man. You start you start playing something and everyone's like, dude, and like jumping up and down and you come up with a part and it just makes the track, man. Once you feel that feeling one time, you just want to do it every day. And uh, I love that feeling, you know, the magic overdub, man. And uh, I asked him, I go, all those great records you guys made, um, I said, you know that feeling when you come up with like the banging 
part that just makes the track. And he goes, oh yeah. I go, what moment do you remember the most of coming in and doing overdub and just making, and everyone was like, Hitsville. And he was like, uh, American, American Girl. He said when he came in, they had the track and he came in and started going, ding, 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 that octave thing. And, and he said everybody was just like, hell yes. And that was like his, uh, he, he, that's his number one memory. I asked John Oates that same question, unrelated, but still funny. Uh, uh, John Oates is a really close friend of mine. And uh, I asked him about that same question one time. Moment when you just came in with the fucking money overdub. And he was like, oh, dude. He said, we were doing a session one time and uh, we had just got done for the day. And we really weren't, we weren't planning on doing anything else. We were packing up. And Daryl had just gotten this new drum machine. And um, he was kind of goofing with it a little bit out in the, in the live room. And he turned it on and it, just, and it just was sitting there playing a beat. And it was just going, and nobody really cared. Nobody was really trying to make a new song or anything. And he just he was just about to leave and he and he picked up a guitar and he just plugged it in the console and he was like And everyone was like, Okay, maybe we should stick around for a little longer. And uh that was right out of the horse's mouth when John told me that story. You know that feeling. It's such a great feeling, man, when you you come up with a part that's just fucking money, man. And like I'd say for every hundred times you try it, you might get one, you know, like you, you try to come up with the money part, you know, and you just keep fishing, fishing. But man, when you find it, that it makes the, the, the clouds part, man. And, the, and it's just, it's a good feeling. Is yeah. It, I can't go for that. Is yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Make sure I had the right one. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a funny, it's a, I don't know why that popped in my head. I remember that's one of the things I talked with Mike about, you know. He's a good guy. He's a very down-to-earth kind of cool guy. Were you at Tom's last gig? Was that at the Hollywood Bowl? Man, I don't, I don't know. What I, what I do remember, I didn't, we never played the Hollywood Bowl with them, but I do remember we did a good bit of that tour, and I think they went on without us. And I think that maybe would maybe have been a, a bit after. But that was definitely the year, I know. 2017, you know, and it was a bit of a shock to, yeah, it's kind of a drag, man. I was playing with Lucinda Williams, and uh, we were opening, it was late 90s, we were opening for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers on a tour. And it lasted maybe 32 or 34, 35 days, 30 performances, 35 dates. And um, it was fabulous. I mean, their crew was great to us. They treated us like gold. Tom was a big fan of Lucinda's, and so was Mike. And they they covered one of her songs, um, you know, on on record, you know, before this tour happened. And you know, it was like all big arena rock tours. Being in the opening act is sort of not so exciting uh, because. Most of the audience isn't even seated yet when you're playing your little 25 minute set, you know, or 30 minute set or whatever it is. And, uh, and even more of those people don't know who you are. You know, never heard of Lucinda Williams. And so, you know, it was that part was OK, but they those guys, I got to know those guys and, you know, they're Florida hippies. And. The first thing I really kind of realized about them is they never saw themselves as belonging to any scene. They see themselves, even at their most popular, they saw themselves as being outsiders in every, everywhere in this world. They were outsiders. It was them against the world. They, you know, they had their own thing and they didn't fit in with anybody. And that was really the way they were, you know. Tom especially, he was really a, a closely guarded kind of private, um, quiet, shy outsider. You know, he never really got over that. He never really was a, hey, how you doing, celebrity kind of guy. You know, he, he was, you know, in his dressing room or in Mike's dressing room, just the two of them. They were just kind of apart, you know. And um, from, uh, somehow, they they mostly would stand backstage and watch us play every night, and 
um, for whatever reason, they were very friendly with me and we got to talk in guitars a lot. And they would invite me into the dressing room a lot, the, Mike and Tom, and we maybe they'd have a couple of guitars in there and they'd show me stuff. And, you know, we just sit around and kind of not just talk about stuff, you know, like not really anything too exciting, but guitar stuff, you know, just like, yeah, man, those pickups on that model of that year are really good, you know, yeah, man, now you look at this one, man. Oh, man, that's nice, you know, all these vintage guitars and uh, acoustic and electric. And I got to be kind of pals with them, you know, just for, for that tour. They were, you know, we just would hang around. And uh, I remember we were in the Hamptons in Long Island. And I was really excited about being there because I'm a kind of a foodie. And I was like, man, there was like, we were at this nice hotel and there was all these fabulous restaurants on the, you know, like within walking distance. And I was like, I've got the night off, man. I'm going to go find a good restaurant, have a good glass of wine and sit and have a nice meal and really enjoy myself. You know, and I took a shower, you know, I was laying on my bed. It's about 630 I'm laying on my bed and my hotel phone rings, you know. Right? Hey, this is Tom. What are you doing, man? I said, uh, oh, I don't know, man. Just laying here. Listen, uh, I got the guys to pull the buses around back, and uh, uh, we, we got a grill out there. We're going to grill some hot dogs and hamburgers and just hang out, you know, and maybe play a little, just hang out by ourselves back there in the back, you know. And um, I'd like, you know, come on down and hang out with us and have a burger with us. <laughs> it's like, I'll be there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there went my fabulous meal. You know, <laughs> I was going to eat potato chips, drink beer, and, and, and eat a hamburger, you know. <laughs> but I was glad to do that, you know. And that was the only time that, that we had a social outside of the gig situation was that one night in the Hamptons. It was a beautiful summer evening. Um, they had a big boom box there, which was playing like Jimmy Reed and um, old Rolling Stones, you know, like Brian Jones era, 60s Stones and, uh, you know, Slim Harpo, um, Howlin' Wolf, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, that's what was on the just like a continuous reel of cool songs on the on the thing, and we would just sit and listen and smoke weed, drink beer, eat hamburgers, and talk about music. And sitting back in folding lawn chairs, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was the nicest, mellowest evening, you know. And they were, nobody was getting rowdy, you know. Those guys weren't big drinkers or anything, you know. They they were lightweights. And uh, they're just there, you know, just smoking a little weed, having a good time. <laughs> that's, a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good way to go through life. Yeah, yeah, they were really nice. The last time I saw them, they invited me to come down and see them at the Bridgestone. And um, I, this friend of mine from Kentucky was in town, and his, his son had recently been killed in an auto accident. And he and he's been divorced, and he's. And I they gave me two tickets. And my wife was out of town, and so I called him up and said, "Hey, man, you're in town tonight. You want to go see Tom Petty?" He said, "Yeah, sure." And he's a guitar maker, right? He makes like really nice copies of, of Stratocasters and Telecasters. Really nice. His name's Charles Whitfield. Great guitars. He said, "Do you think of? Uh, think we can meet Tom and Mike?" And I said, "I don't know, dude." Said, can I bring one of my guitars to show him? I said, no, you can't. <laughs> I said, they don't want to see your guitar, dude. You know, <laughs> you know, they. I'm sorry. They've they've had a million people try to give them guitars, but they don't want anything to do with that. He's like, okay. So uh, we went to dinner and went over there, and and Stevie Wynn was, was the opening act, you know, and, and that was pretty good, you know. And, um, so about halfway through, I said, "You want to let's? We got these backstage passes. Let's go up to the green room and get something good to drink, you know, because they had this like separate sort of green room for, you know, journalists and people in town that know somebody and the crew and the band. You know, it's like you can't get to back to the real backstage. You're just in this sort of kind of pretend backstage. But 
it's always fully stocked. I know how their thing works. And we went up there and sure enough, you can, you know, fabulous drinks and, you know, everything you need, you know, and we got ourselves something to eat and a snack and had a beer, you know, and I, we were about ready to go back downstairs to listen to the rest of when was that just somebody tapped me on the shoulder. It was Ron Blair, their old bass player, you know, who was back in the band. And he said, Hey man, come back with me, you know? And so I said, come on, Charles. And we go back and, he opens this door to a dressing room and we walked in. It was Tom and Mike sitting there by themselves, just the two of them. And my friend is, you know, mute, speechless, you know. I was like, this is my friend Charles. He makes guitars. And, you know, I said, sit down, man. You know, how, you know, how you doing, man? <laughs> and they're both just sitting there. And we talked to him for about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, uh, you know. And first thing Tom says, have you heard Lucy his new album? I said, yeah, I have. And he says, man, it's really good, man. It's the only thing I've heard for a while. It's it's worth the shit. I said, yeah, it's really good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, right there. You know, he, that's first thing he says. You know, I was like, that's pretty cool. And we just shot the shit for a while. How's Marty? You know, Marty knows those guys from the um, uh, Rick Rubin sessions that the Johnny Cash stuff. You know. So he's, he knew them from that, you know, they were fans of our band, you know. Well, I'm a, a huge fan of Tom Petty and the way he uh, progressed as an artist and how he handled everything and the way he ended up, you know, uh, as far as his music goes. Um, uh, he's a great songwriter and a great, you know, craftsman and just, you know, he always was serious about his stuff, you know, to a fault, probably. He, you know, we, I think he, you know, his, I think he put his songs and his art above everything else in his life. I'm, I know he did, you know, I know, I know he did. And that's why we have those great songs to listen to, you know, because he cared more than most artists do. He invested himself more of himself into his his songs than most people do, and it was you know, it was their little band against the world even to the day they died. You know, to the day he died, it was you know, and Mike's kind of carried it on a little bit. You know, I don't know if you've seen any any of his YouTube videos. Or, you know, he um, when Mike went out with Fleetwood Mac, uh, Stevie Nicks has a guy named Steve Rial who is a great singer and he's been her vocal coach for years and he goes on the tour and he warms Stevie up every day. And Steve took Mike under his wing and said, come on, son, let's, let's work on you voice here. And, um, he turned Mike into a great singer. I mean, and Michael tell you, you know, that he did, but he's singing his ass off now, man. He sounds so good. I can't believe it. He's just killing me with his singing, you know? It's really good. And I was just so impressed, you know? And that was because of his, that, you know, he had fortunate to be in day to day hanging with Steve Riel and have that kind of guy working you every day, you know? And like, Steve's really good. He's a great vocal coach and a great singer. I, th I think what we did first is we played a show with Jackson Brown and Tom Petty came, and then somehow we ended up on this doing dates with Tom Petty. Those guys were super nice, you know, especially uh, Mike Campbell, you know, like one of the first or second days I show up and they're at my guitar station. I, you know, I had to, to cover that gig. I had to have five guitars out there tunings and capos and 12 strings and, and I get there and there's Mike Campbell is playing my custom painted Todd Hansen Telecaster you know and uh and they were just like guys in a band and he was like yeah man if you want to play my 55 gold top go ahead and I was like I'm, I'm like well I I use weird strings and I I declined but they they were super nice. Well, yeah, he had a like a I forget specifically if he had one or two Princetons and he had a Vox and he had a, a 
not a Leslie, but the Fender Vibra tone cabinet, which is the speaker doesn't rotate a, a piece of foam in front of the speaker rotates. I think they both had them. I mean, those guys had so much gear, you know, so much gear. And they like, they really enjoyed it. You know, like they were like, like the stones, you know, like when the Andy Babchek, his book about the Beatles gear came out, I was like, imagine if he could do the stones. And then he did the stones. Like, but the Beatles had like 15 guitars in their whole quiver through their whole career where the stones had, you know, they were into the hundreds by 1970. You know, they went on TV shows with, with Brian and uh, Keith with matching Firebird 7s. That's like the Les Paul custom of Firebirds, gold hardware, ebony fretboard, big inlays. And Tom and Mike were like that with their, you know, okay, we're playing the Firebirds on this one. Or, you know, like they, you could tell they, they had real uh, joy out of the gear. And and if you, if you ever saw uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, you know, like, you know, Tom would do, he'd have one solo where he'd, whip it out, do his solo, and it, and it just, it communicated, you know. It was nothing like Mike, but it wasn't trying to be. There was another, we, we had friends out there too, the guy, Steve Winstead, who goes by the name Chinner, he uh, was, who had also teched for the George Satellites, he was out there with them, and, you know, at the time, uh, Justin Earl was my guitar tech, uh, it, it it was really great, but then we got, it was a business thing. We got moved to the Mary Chapin Carpenter tour, uh, which was more of a co-bill, and I think it was a positive monetary thing. You know, it's expensive to have a full band. So that was, we only did like two weeks with Tom, but it was really, they were super nice. They were putting together a tour on uh, Let Me Up, I've Had Enough, which did not sell well for them. Yeah. You know, most people would love to have their not sell well. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, Tom was right there, you know, first day of the tour. Hey, how you doing? You know, and it's just like, it, with, with Stan and Mike, I already felt like, shit, I went to high school with these guys. You know, maybe a year older and a year younger. And uh, and the whole band was that way. You know, we were just kind of like a bunch of normal guys. On that tour, we were, had the Del Fuegos, and we were the meat and the sandwich, you know, band. Uh, and we just had, it was the best time ever. It was just the best time ever. Two months of, of, of playing with guys that you considered heroes and relatable heroes. They always had, you know, a little drum kit, two little amps and a bass amp, you know, and stuff. And they said, let's go jam some. I went, sure. I said, he said, well, I'll, I'll play drums, you know. <clears throat> and we started just fooling around backstage, you know, just concrete audience, you know. And uh, I think it was... Campbell that came in next, grabbed up the bass, and we started playing along, and uh, said, well, let's do a song, you know, have some fun, let's do Let It Bleed. And so we start in, and then Howie comes in, grabs up another guitar, and we all get going, Tom walks over, and he starts singing the harmony, and I'm going like, nobody's going to believe you, there are no pictures, there is no video, but right now, for these three minutes, you are the coolest guy on planet Earth. <laughs> you know, and it was it was totally fun. We would just quit right after that. You know, you could hang out, you could talk. Um, he was heavy into the pot thing, so you know, there's a couple of pictures somewhere of I got I got a Polaroid of me and Tom, you know, saying hey, giving peace signs or whatever. But you can you see his eyes, and it's just like a river of red. <laughs> and he's he's smiling that. 
well-toasted smile. I'll tell you another story. We're doing a sound check, and um, we start playing, and, and Richard's always covered the song, uh, Something in the Air. And we finished, Ben Mont jumped on piano and was just going like, finally, <laughs> you know. Now, we didn't have the do 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 parts down very well that is in the true break. But anyway, we finished up, and Tom was like 10 rows out in the audience with his hands folded, and he goes, y'all going to cut that? And Richards goes, hell no. And he goes, good, I will. I'll make a million dollars off of it. Walked off. <laughs> <laughs> And he did. <laughs> uh, but uh, he was he was just, uh, I can't tell you how normal a guy he was. You know, I, he had Jane and his kids out with him, who was his ex-wife and, you know, his family. And, you know, there was a little bit of that. You know, he had a little extra work to do just because, you know, Pop needs to do a little few extra things. But it was just a, one giant clan. I mean, the Del Fuegos and us and them, and it's just like it, it, nobody's dressing room door was ever closed, except Tom's when he was getting into show prep mode. He had to do, you know, two hours. I had to do 40 minutes, probably the same 40 minutes I did yesterday, you know, which is one of the big reasons once we got out of the opening opening act slot, I just went, I'll never use a set list unless I have to. Because that thing just became the bane of our existence. You know, it's just like, it times out to 40 minutes exactly. It shows off the first record, which is what we got. Ends up, you know, we put Keep Your Hands Next to Last and Railroad Steel Last every night. You know, to the point where it's like, after a year and a half of that, it's, it's boring. They move around some, but he did he, he did work a list, but he'd skip a song and insert a song. But usually he was too stoned to think of <laughs> much of anything other than look down and go, okay, that next. Uh he was just smooth and regular a guy as you'd ever want to know. He represented who he was physically. In every interview I've seen him do, that's who he really, really is. You know. Now, the guy that broke his hand, you know, smashing it into the wall because it sounded so good. <laughs> Bullshit. Uh, <laughs> you know, he was, no, he was no stranger to the powders, if you've read the book, and he was on Uptown, I'm sure, and something went wrong, I'm sure, and he put his hand through the wall, you know, and just like, well, he's lucky he can play. Yeah. Did you see him later in life at all? No, we we did one opening, two opening shows for him. Uh, I think it was when they fired the replacements. I, Paul sat out to get fired. I know he did. You know, it's like, you know, what else is there to do? <laughs> There's no fun anywhere else. We only get to play 40 minutes. You know, Tommy and Slim can only dress up in Jane and her kids' clothes so many times. <laughs> Tell me how you heard about him passing away. Ah, uh, pretty much like everybody else, I think I heard a uh, a snippet. You know, on maybe I saw something on Facebook and I immediately went to Google and checked it out, and it's just like, did print Prince from right before him, right? It was right around the same time. It was, and they were both by overusing prescription drugs, you know. <clears throat> and I don't know what, in Prince's case, was the mitigating factor that made him want to keep using them. But I know in time, he's playing on a broken hip. It's just like, cancel the rest of the tour. Go home. Do makeup dates, you know. What's wrong with that? But he was... He was that rock and roll soldier guy, you know? He wasn't going to quit. You know, sim silly hip, you know? It's just like, at least put yourself on a stool. Something to where you're just not stressing that fucker, you know, day and night. 
And the pain got so bad, he just went. And I just sat there and went, oh, my God. You know, just so easy to see how it happened. So horrible to see that it did happen. Obviously had more left in the tank. So, um, you know, I heard like everybody else and didn't reach out to anybody. I'm going like, man, they are circling wagons, you know, sitting there going like, what are they going to do? You know, what are they going to do? This was not in anybody's plan. So I just left everybody alone. Um, did get in touch with one of our old guitar tech, Steve Winstead, who's teching for Campbell, and said, you know, how bad is it over in, in, the, in the camp? And he goes, really bad. And I just went, cool, talk later. Yeah, that's it. You know, I'm going like, you know, what can I do? You know, Tom was, Tom was a most believable human being. You know, that's what came away, I came away with because I never saw him in the process of writing. That's where his gift actually lay. Uh, <clears throat> when we were touring with him, you know, he'd do the same rap every night f for a week or so, then change it and then stay with that one for a week or so. And it's like, you know, he wasn't Springsteen like in his off the cuff, turn it into a different story. So I think while he sang really well and he played fine, performance wasn't where he, that wasn't his big thing. His big thing was writing a conversational song. Everyone could relate to, I, you know, I, it's almost Mark Twain, you know, in the, in the, just break it down to where anybody that's ever been 18 years old or 35 years old can sit there and just, you know, wow. Yeah, he grabbed it, you know, whatever my age is, you know, and and he's always stayed, Neil Young-like in his staying true to where he is age-wise, that's hard. You know, that is really hard to stay, you know, true to your, true to your age, you know, and write a rock and roll song. John and I had met several. It's 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 not a long story, but John Jorgens and I have been really good friends. We met uh, when he was playing with Elton, and I, I was playing with Skaggs, Ricky. And anyway, so years later, we I come off the road with Skaggs, and we have this little bluegrass band. And so one day I get a call and said, "Well, Herb's not being going to be able to play with us for the next three months," which we didn't play much. And uh, Herb's going out with Mud Crutch, Tom Petty's. So when they was out on the tour, you know, Tom's a big Birds fan, Roger McGuinn, and loves Chris. And Tom's just a cool music fan, any period. So Herb talked it up, you know, hey, you should produce a record on Chris. And uh, and Tom said, well, Herb, you'll, me and you'll produce it together. So they did. And uh, that's how I got, when the started coming about, I got the call to go out for a couple of weeks and work with Tom and, you know, and hang out and, it was fun. I mean, I mean, he he's just a, an incredible person. Obviously, everybody says that when people pass away, but I mean, he really was. He was so kind and so encouraging, and just sitting around talking about music to him was with him was great. You know, and that that's how it came about. You know, Nashville. We started at ten o'clock in the morning. Well, they would uh, start at three in the afternoon, in general, and so uh, I was already there, and and uh, I was set up and. You know, and Tom just walks in, you know, and I'm like, you know, I just start laughing. I just, you know, I mean, I don't know what to say because, you know, it's just, it's, but, you know, he was just so nice. He came over and, and shook hands and introduced himself, you know, to that. That's one of the funniest things to me about Tom is he would tell you things like you did, like he was just a regular guy working down at the gas station. He would tell you stuff about him that, of course, I knew you were in a band with George Harrison, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. So that, yeah, he was, it was great. I mean, I can't, I can't say a, a enough good things about him in that experience, you know. Yeah. One of the, we re, uh, re recorded at the clubhouse, which is where they, 
I guess the Heartbreakers have done their last several albums and and rehearsed there, and there 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 would be like thirty foot of Rickenbacker twelve strings, and then there would be another thirty foot of a. Uh, early 60s Telecasters, you know, <laughs> and they would just be stacked up, you know, there would be 50 of them stacked up. And then so, you know, we Tom got to show me guitars and uh, I was looking at the, at the 12 strings and I said, well, which one is the damn the torpedoes? Because there were 20 red ones. And he, he gets a ladder and gets up there and grabs it down and shows it to me and lets me play it. And, wow. you know, so that that's that's that was pretty cool. How did it play? Uh, great. I mean, they were all. Chenner, the guy that was, has always been Tom and, and Mike's uh, tech, was there. You know, had their tech and all their crew was just kind of helping around with the studio for whatever we needed. And, and Chenner is a great guy. I guess he's out with Fleetwood Mac now, and yeah, with those guys. But he, uh, yeah. I mean, everything that Chenner does is just perfect. You know, yeah. I mean, just top notch and taking care of you and stuff. So, I mean, he has a great organization for. You know, to have the same crew for 40 years, you know, and the same guys that work for you. I mean, that says a lot about somebody. So the second day we're recording, I, I go in, I get there early. You know, I'm there 2 o'clock. Nobody's there except some of the crew. And um, I go over to the coffee pot, and, and right next to the coffee pot was uh, the Statler Brothers album, Lester Roadhog Moran and the Cadillac Cowboys. And I, I had took a picture of it. And... Uh, Man, what is this record doing? That that's incredible. And then so Tom comes in, you know, a little bit later, and I said, "Hey, I got to ask you something." I said, "I said the album next to the coffee pot, the Roadhog." I said, "Do you know that record, or is that just something you stuck up there?" He says, "No, man." He said, "That's mine and the Heartbreakers' favorite album." He said, "When we," he said, "When we moved out to California and all rode out," he said, "We would sit and quote that whole album and listen to it in on on a cassette driving out to, from." Florida, and he says we can quote that whole record, and so he's Tom started quoting the whole record. You know, I just, I just thought that was a cool thing, you know. So that that's kind of how I knew that, we, you know, hey, this is somebody I want to be around. You know, <laughs> well, the Lester Roadhog Moran and Cadillac. If you don't know that record, uh, by all means, get out and get it. It it uh, there's it's a comedy record that the Statler Brothers did. And uh, it became so popular that they had to quit doing it because <laughs> they were supposed to hear that. It's it's just, it's just a comedy record where they they take an alias uh, and uh, they imitate these guys, you know, like you've heard from your hometown or my hometown, you know. And I was in some of those bands that played that way. <laughs> so, but it's just it's just great. I mean, it's just genius. He told me that he was at this restaurant in L.A., I guess it was, and he said, this is the best coffee I've ever had. And he said something, and they took him back to the kitchen, and the guy said, well, it's Maxwell House. And he says, but this is how you have to make it. And so on our sessions, Tom would make the coffee, and it was Maxwell House. And I have to say, I don't know what it was. It was pretty good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which that's good for Nashville, Maxwell House, you know, yeah. <laughs> so... You know, it was all about feel, and it, it was nothing about notes. It was, uh, I, you know, I, th I think he just wanted the feel of something, you know, and because uh, there would be things, you know, that maybe we could do better or something, but he would just say, no, no, that, that feels good, you know, and, and he, he would give his opinion, and, you know, he liked, uh, you know, I guess he's from school that simpler is better, you know, and, and I like to play for the singer. I, I like to stay out of the way of the singer. You know, some people, I don't get how, well, you play too simple, but I just can't cover up the vocal. It's just a thing that's been, in, you know, from the, when I was a kid, I, I want to hear the singing and what, or if somebody's playing a guitar solo, well, what's he saying there? I just want to support that. And that's what Tom wanted. One of the funny stories was uh, uh, when Steve Ferroni, they were, he was telling me that they were trying out drummers, you know, when Steve Ferroni got the job and the, uh, so he said that we had a room out there, and he said, I've never tried out anybody. I just hire who I like. And he said there was a room out there with about 30 drummers, and he, he, I guess it was Mark, the guy that works for Tom, came in and said, I don't know who's out here, but somebody walked in, and everybody but eight people left. <laughs> and Tom says, well, let's get him in here and see what he can do. And so they got him in there, and Tom said, yeah, oh, yeah, he's the one. And he says, but he can just – he was telling me, we were talking about playing some and he said, I just have to tell him not to do stuff. He said, he is so great. Obviously he's a great player, you know? Yeah. 
And I just think it's cool because most time people will hear you do a cool lick and they'll never say, that's great, but, you know, just play simple, you know. Yeah. Tom liked Ringo's playing, you know. It was all about the feel and the tone. And so that's kind of where I'm at with it, too. The album, Chris's album had just came out and, and uh, Chris was on a, Chris and Herb and John and myself had been playing a few shows and, uh, and mainly Chris and John and her, you know, they had the Desert Rose band. So they, they, and they would go out as a trio, all acoustic. But we were, we were, I had went on vacation and had to, my wife and I went to Italy and, uh, we were in Rome and I got to get a call from, uh, maybe Herb or I don't know if it's Mark Carpenter or anyway, one of, I think it may have been Herb and just said, Hey, uh, don't believe what you hear about Tom. I'm like, what, have my phone been hacked? What are you talking? You know? And he said, well, he's, he said, Tom's in the hospital, but he's going to be okay. And then, so about 30 minutes later, I, we get a call that he, he had passed away and we were in Rome and, you know, it's just devastating because we, we were actually flying home to uh, rehearse and we were going to play with Chris at the Troubadour, Hillman. And Tom was going to play and I think Steve Ferroni and, you know, John and her and so, and, uh, you know, just, uh, it, it, it was devastating, really. I mean, you know, it, it didn't happen. And it, we ended up a few, few weeks, a few months later doing like a kind of a memorial service for Tom and playing the, playing the record, you know. David Crosby was going to come out. Uh, he didn't, he was sick. He didn't get to come out for that one, you know. But, the, you know, that was going to be a highlight to get to play with Chris. First of all, he's probably realistically one of my all-time favorite singers. And, uh, you know, David Crosby and, and Tom and, you know, who are Mike, I think probably Mike Campbell was going to be involved with it, you know, yeah. with playing. From what I understood, it was just going to be the guys who played on Chris's record. Oh, well, and the thing that I liked about uh, Tom Petty and those guys it, is it's Tom. It's totally Tom. It, uh, I, I get it. I mean, I, I really do think that it was Tom and, and Mike Campbell. But Tom wanted something that you could latch on to. He wanted, you know, Nashville has gotten away from – you know, when I grew up, you, as soon as the song started, you knew that guitar riff, and you, that was kind of the thing through the song, and that that that's what carried that song. And it's it's not like that anymore. But Tom Petty, and the, and those guys kept that going. You know, when you heard the first two bars, you knew what song it was. You know, and that's what I miss about a lot of music. Was Mike, Mike Campbell involved in any of this? Uh, Mike played on on the on the record, uh, but he he wasn't there. When, um, when when I track, I think he may have overdubbed, and so did Ben Mott, you know. And uh, but I, you know, when Bud Crutch came to town, uh, Jessica and I went out to eat with with Mike, and and it was fun. It's a good you know, good stories and stuff. So I mean, I love those those guys are so. I mean, they're just incredible. Uh, I think they're probably get shot for saying this, but to me, Tom Petty was probably the last great American rock and roll band. I mean, there's a lot of bands that I'm into now, but uh, that are new bands that are great, but I, do, I don't know if they'll have the thing that Tom had, the wealth of music that, that they continually put out, you know, in songs. So, you know, there was a bit of Southern pride in Tom Petty. He'd already moved to L.A. and started making records there, but, you know, we knew he was from the South, and it's like, this is... He's really great, and he's from the South. So I was a big Tom Petty fan. All me and my friends, um, this is something we could really kind of get around. But I end up moving to Hollywood in the early 80s, and, um, you know, I'm trying to get work and do things as a photographer. I'm still young. I'm still sucking in some ways. Uh, not that great, but, you know, getting better, trying hard. And I become friends with this guy who had uh, been doing work with Billy Idol, Bob Dylan, all these people that kind of shared the same management, and um, Tom Petty. And um, he knew I was a Petty fan and everything. But anyway, one day I was at his house, and he goes, i got to go over to Petty and them are rehearsing over in the Valley. Do you want to go? And I said, I guess so. <laughs> so we went over to Burbank to Joe, Frank Zappa's rehearsal joint, Joe's Garage. And so we went over. I happened to have my camera with me. So we went over there, and there's um, 
Petty and the guys just in a rehearsal joint, um, rehearsing and smoking lots of weed. So I go in and, you know, get very high with uh, those guys, and they're all friendly, and I take some pictures. And we hang out for two or three hours, and then we leave. I remember Tom holding the door open, and he goes, I'll see you tomorrow. And I'm like, you will. <laughs> and that just became two years or so of um, showing up and hanging out. So I was shooting all these pictures and hanging out with him, kind of coming in the back door through the sky. But then MCA Records started seeing these pictures, and he said, oh, this who's this guy shooting Petty and getting behind the scenes? Um, so they started hiring me, and then the management uh, started the same thing, started seeing him. It's like, oh, Petty seems to like this guy, so we'll start hiring him. And that's what happened. So I started getting jobs from MCA and the management and just hanging out. Going over to their house, his house, their house. Um, and that was all fun, of course, because, I mean, I was starstruck in the beginning, starstruck in the beginning, obviously, because I was a big fan, but then they just turned out to be Southern guys that were like my friends. They had good taste in music, and they were very nice guys and, um, you know, funny guys. I mean, back here somewhere, I've got the skateboarding picture um, when I went out. You know, every time you're around him, there's pot and coffee. It's never any, I don't remember booze ever, but it was just pot and coffee and cigarettes. So going over to his house, there was coffee. It must have been Maxwell House. I didn't ask him, and he didn't say, would you like some Maxwell House coffee? He just said, would you like some coffee? Yeah. <laughs> when he's on that skateboard. Did he just happen to get out a skateboard and he was actually a skateboarder? Or? He was, I was a skateboarder in Florida. And I'm like, why? Well, hey, I was a skateboarder back in the day, too. So um, we were just walking around his house. I think we'd probably gotten high and we're just somehow we're in the garage. And I said, oh, a skateboard. And he said, yeah. And he picked it up and he started skating around. Then I skated and we're like skating back and forth. And I'm like, well, I got to get a picture of Petty skateboarding. <laughs> and so I just clicked it. But, you know, it's... He's obviously a skateboarder. If you see that photo, he's um, he, he may not be doing it every day, but he obviously had skateboarded before. He like had a very dog town, you know, smooth surf style. On and off. Once I left, I left L.A. in the late '80s to move to New York, and um, so the only place I would see Petty then was at a show. Everyone, if I was in the same city as a show, I would call the management and get some tickets and go see him. I, mean, I took my mom to see him. I took probably a friend or two somewhere. But, you know, go backstage and say, hey, but that was it. I'm guessing you heard about his passing like everyone else did. Yeah, it was just so, you know, I wrote this thing on Facebook. Um, it just really, uh, it really affected me. Um, you know, it's not like we were best friends or anything, but we we connected and we were friends. Um, he's a busy guy with friends all over the world and all kinds of stuff. But it just, he, I don't know, he, he meant a lot. His music meant a lot. His, um, and he gave me a break, you know. I was a, a Greenhorn rookie at that time, and he kind of allowed me, I mean, he was a superstar at, the, at that point. And he kind of just, you know, let me in the door and said, see you tomorrow. And, and, you know, in a lot of ways, he, you know, it was the thing in my career that really, like, took it off. I mean, I guess it would have happened with somebody sooner or later. But the way it happened with him was super cool. All those guys were great. He was great. I just always liked the way he stood up for his fans and, um, you know, the whole thing about raising the album price. I mean, he went up against his record label and called bullshit and all this stuff. So I just thought he was very honorable, super talented. I mean, everybody loved him. Bob Dylan loved him. George Harrison loved him. He's loved by Beatles and Dylan. He was universally loved. People just liked being around him. And he was a music fan besides all his talent. He just loved. He was always listening to Elvis' son era stuff like kind of almost autistically always listening to son Elvis. <laughs> Beautiful. 
and Maxwell House coffee, but. If you'd like to see some of Jim's photographs, I'll put a link down below. But if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, subscribe to my channel, click the like button, and tell me down below what your favorite Tom Petty song is, and I'll see you somewhere down the road. Much love to you. Well, I, I'll go back to me being from North Carolina. Um, and the age, I, you know, I graduated high school in 1981, so that tells you my age roughly. And, um, you know, what had, and, you know, I love, as a lot of the, your fans and your audience probably do, you know, a lot of Southern rock and roll and country and rockabilly and all that shit, blues, all that Southern stuff that is good. But at some point along the way, around, you know, the 80s and stuff, uh, we got Southern rock. I was very not into that scene of that kind of stuff. So when Petty, Tom Petty came around, uh, suddenly, you know, this whole Florida connection, because Florida was where it was a lot of those redneck kind of Southern rock bands came from. So if, as if Florida's not bad enough, you had that shit coming out of there. Sorry if I'm making people mad, but uh, so, you know, there was a bit of Southern pride in Tom Petty. He'd already moved to L.A. and started making records there. But, you know, we knew he was from the South. And it's like, this is he's really great. And he's from the South. So I was a big Tom Petty fan. All me and my friends. Um, this is something we could really kind of get around. I guess the first time I might have met Tom Petty would be at uh, the, some like rock bowling party or something like that. Uh, rock bowl, like some D, some DJ or promo guy, or like one of those, like all these rockers would show up, and everybody would show up like stoned out of their minds. So I met him at something like that. He came with his wife at the time, and they were like bombed, and we were too. And like I can't even remember if we bowled or what. But then uh, the first time I saw Petty play was the day the Plimsoll, uh, the the day the Nerves arrived in uh, Los Angeles. We drove down from San Francisco on January one, nineteen seventy seven. And the first day we went there, it was either, I don't remember the order of this, but one day we went there to the Whiskey A Go Go. That was like our pilgrim, or the site of contact for us to get to LA. This band Van Halen is playing. And we go in there and there's like 50 people there. It's like the last show at the Whiskey on, you know, we, you know, some night. Van Halen's playing. It was January 1, I think. Or it was either this one way or the other. And Van Halen, we're like, these guys stink, man. Like, like. <laughs> Bad. Like they do the worst version of you really got me. I've ever heard in my life. And the guy's like doing wanking on the guitar. Like this is crap, you know? And then, so we left like, this stuff's not going anywhere. And then we come back the next day. You know, I kind of like those guys now, but at the time, but I just like, what the fuck? And then uh, we go back the next day and the top petty and the heartbreakers. And then they're also playing about for about 50 or 60, you know, mostly girls that are like standing around in front of the stage. And it was really empty. And I'm like, well, these guys, this is better than Van Halen, you know, a lot better, you know. So we kind of got into that a little bit. And then uh, I knew Petty because I can't remember the order of things, but we played shows with him, you know, a number of shows. And so the Plimsolls did. He liked the Plimsolls a lot. We played at the Whiskey one night to shut down the Whiskey, and uh, Petty came. Somebody, you know, we set it up so that Petty would come, and, and it was the closing of the Whiskey, like, it opened up again later, but it was the actual real closing of the real whiskey. Like, the whole place went out, like, in a riot at the end of it. Like, people were carrying out booths and shit, you know. The, the original booths of, like, the Beatles and Jane Mansfield sat and all that kind of stuff. So, he came down, and uh, we played, uh, we rehearsed and hung out and played, and, and we played uh, She's About a Mover, and we played with the Plimsolls and Petty. It was just, like, the five of us. And Route 66... Maybe something else. I can't. I can't remember what else. And I remember Petty just came over and yelling in my ear, "You got a great band, man!" I think he was mad at his band all the time, and so <laughs> he he really liked the Plimsolls. I don't know why, but we you know we were a pretty rocking band, and he loved it. And so then we started playing festivals with him, and it was always nice to be around him. We played some huge festival up north, Mountaineer Festival or something. I forget what it was called. And we played a couple of nights at the Universal Amphitheater opening up for him. And he was, so he was super friendly. I never really wrote with him or went to his house or anything like that, you know. But I just knew him from on stage and dressing rooms, you know. I knew, I knew Stan really good. And I hung out with Stan a lot. 
he was a super intense, really funny, but like super ego driven guy. And then, uh, I mean, I, I stand, but you know, he's, he was a good guy though, but he, you know, he, he was really satirical. And I imagine that got on Tom's nerves after a while. And then Ben Mont was like the sweetest guy in the world. And we both, we, we knew this uh, girl uh, in common, you know, we had like a common friend and she brought me over to Ben's house and I would sit and play piano with Ben. And so that was like a big moment where I watched a guy who could really play piano. You know, I mean, I've seen a lot of people who could really play piano, but he's one of them. And I sat with him and played. And so that was really interesting. That was like back in like 81 maybe or something like that. And then uh, Mike played on my album. When Howie first came to town, I'm walking down uh, Laurel Canyon Boulevard, like walking up, and this guy, this guy pulls up in like in a 57 Chevy, just picks me up. It was high. He wasn't even in the band yet, you know. That's how I met Howie. He was like a super nice guy. He just, hey, man, you know, get a ride, man, you know. I guess he knew, you know, recognized me or something. So that was cool. But, uh, yeah, that's all. I don't know that much about Patty personally. I probably knew him less than anybody. But I thought he was always a real positive guy to be around. He had a great vibe, and he was always, like, really, he always kind of felt good after being around him. Like, you know, sort of like Prine in a way. You know, you felt like he... Uh, honored other people so he was he wasn't like a bitter cynical kind of guy that much in a way to me i didn't think i know some people might have thought he was but i didn't i thought he was like a very positive like really you know um creative guy to recognize that in other people you know i i liked him a lot they were really good but when it really started to seem good was on that red album the third record that's when it all of a sudden this really everyone they blew up and they blew out you know that's when we all took that. I mean, I took that record home and like listened to it a lot. You know, like that. You know, the first two records were good, but then when that record came out, you go, okay, this, these guys just hit a home run. This is like a, you know, like a real like every cut on this record is a great cut. And so um, I'd already known quite a bit about him. I was friends with this guy Gary Sparaza that, that had interviewed Tom, and this was in '77. Gary was from Buffalo. He had a record a magazine called Shaken Street. And he was like one of the original, like one of those kids that like big star in 74 and all that kind of thing. And so I was, he was a soul music aficionado. And uh, also he had endless interviews, like some big long interview with Petty. And he would always, he's, sounds like he works at a gas station. He'd always say it's like crazy things like that. <laughs> but, you know, but, uh, we, but we liked him, you know. And I used to go over to, um, I liked Phil Seymour a lot. And like we used to go over to, um. For a while, me, Elkis, and Frack, and the guys I wrote A Million Miles Away with, we used to go down and write songs at Shelter. And we were trying to um, get covers but from people at Shelter. So we went in there, and they would buy us, you know, they'd get us high and, like, you know, buy us whatever we wanted. And then we'd sit in this back room where there was a piano and write songs, trying to get lucky. And, you know, um, Phil loved the song I wrote called Now. And so um, I was trying to get Phil Seymour to join the Plimsolls. I really didn't want to be the singer for the film, so it would have been so much easier to not be. And uh, he wanted to do it, but he wanted to call it Phil Seymour and the Plimsolls because he'd been in the Dwight Twilley band and nobody knew who. Are you Dwight Twilley? No, you're Phil Seymour. Like, why are you in the Dwight Twilley band? You're the lead singer, you know? So he was sore from that and all that. So I was friendly with those people at Shelter and Petty had just been through there. So, yeah, there was a whole vibe of all those kind of guys. And they were inspiring, but... They were inspiring to me more as like guys that were making records and were writing more than a live band yet at that point. Like it wasn't all together, but I found it inspiring that one, they had a record contract, two, that they were like writing the way they were, you know, especially Petty, but also Dwight. And and uh, I like to listen to the magic with Petty playing bass on it. You know that track? Uh, it's on the second, second Dwight Twilly band record. It's a great song called... Not listen to the magic. It's called uh, looking for the magic. Oh, oh, I, I'm looking for the magic in your eyes, or something like that. And and Tom plays ba Tom Petty plays bass on it. And it's just a great track. And I I really admired those tracks. And uh, I was a fan of that kind of thing. And I admired the fact that they were in the studio. It seemed like another world than the one I was in, which was like you know funky. I'd been in the nerves, but like we just done like we recorded it. Chinatown, you know. Actually, the guy did a great work in Chinatown, Kelly Kwan, but should have done a whole album with him. But, like, I looked up to these guys that had connections with all that stuff, and, like, you wondered, like, how do people, you know, do things like that, you know, that kind of shit, you know. So it was, uh, you know, how, do, how does it even happen, you know? How did Tom Petty do that, you know? 
you know, but, you know, he'd been at it for a long, long time, you know. So, I mean, I had too, but, you know, he, he was more, I think, focused on success in the realm than I was. Like, I, I think he might have had a um, stronger vision of himself earlier than I did, or maybe a different kind of vision than I had because uh, I had a certain kind of belief in myself, but it wasn't exactly just to be like a rocker and like to make it big as a rocker, you know. I, I was... I had like I was kind of thinking about a lot of different things, and so plus I was out of my mind. You know, I don't know how out of his mind he was, but I was like really fucking out of my mind when I got to California. I mean, you know, acid casually doesn't quite grab the whole sense of it, but you know, it's somewhere in that ballpark. You know, of like uh, a lot of acid, a lot of abuse, a lot of like insane people. Uh, you know, a lot of problems in Buffalo. Dropped out after ninth grade. Uh, you know, got in trouble. You know, fucked up. You know, and then living on the street. And like my best friends were like, you know, felons that were running from the law. You know, we were like, you know, <laughs> I'm serious. And then you know, that's what we were doing out there. And and so, I mean, they weren't people that hurt anybody, but they were running from the feds and shit. And so, uh, you know, it was a lot of problems. And so. Um, but, you know, um, it's in my book, actually, which sells for $100 a copy on Amazon. But what doesn't? Do you remember the last time you saw Petty? I just saw him in passing at, at a um, J.J. Cal gig at McCabe's. Him and uh, Campbell were there sitting in with them. Uh, it was shortly, yeah, that would be the last time. You know, I, I, I talked to Mike. I don't remember talk. I don't remember actually really talking to Tom at that one. I, I just saw him, but I don't think he saw me. And like he was up playing with JJ Kell. JJ Kell came out to check me out one night down and uh, check out my show with my head. That little trio down. We're down in San Diego, and he came to some horrible club we were playing down in San Diego to see me play with his trio I had. And so we're in the middle of the set, and like I look, and uh, all of a sudden I'm like, "Fuck! I'm having this is like an '89. I'm like having a heart attack. Holy shit! I'm having a fucking heart attack." And then, and I you know, I can't breathe in my fucking chest. And I look over at the bass player, and he's like, "Oh, he's having a heart attack too." And then the drummer, he's like, "Everybody, like somebody set off mace in the club." <laughs> so the whole club, we're like dying, man. And so like the whole club just like empties out on the street, and like we get, we finally come through the confusion, and we see JJ Kell like out at the other end of the parking lot, getting his car, and like. <laughs> so I never met him, but. But those guys all played with him on that gig. That, you know, it's, as far as I remember, that would probably be the time. The last time I talked to him at all was we played some big gig with him back in the, the Plimsolls days. I think I don't. I don't think I ever talked to him after the Plimsolls. I, I can't remember though. I don't think I did. He was very friendly when, when we were all doing the thing with the Plimsolls and all that. But. Uh, the greatest night ever was when uh, my friend Frank and I went to um, saw the sound check of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers when they played Letterman when Echo first came out. We had built uh, a couple of bases for Howie Epstein uh, a couple years before, and I don't remember. I thought it was like a whiskey, some some residence that they did, and. It may be this um, uh, Fillmore thing that where they're coming on 25 years of right now. But basically, they were playing some club in L.A. for two weeks straight. And he just wanted some good gear there, Howie. And we had built a couple of, of Rogers bases for him. Uh, when Echo came out, you know, I mean, I, Wildflowers literally changed my life. It righted my musical ship. It, it totally made me go like, oh, yeah, okay, this is what you are. This is what you are meant to listen to. You know, everything with Steve Ferrone was so just awesome. And, and at, at this point, I'm in a band, and Mike Campbell is like my number one muse. So, you know, they're playing Letterman. Somehow we got comps. We, we, we were up and back and forth. Uh, Will Lee, you know, the bass player in the world's most dangerous band, he played a Sadowski, still does. So, I mean, he was in the shop all the time. We're right down the street. We worked on their stuff, too. You know, we were able to go to the sound check. Just go. 
We had no mission. We had no reason to be there, but we were allowed to go. And uh, it was, so I'm a Beatles kid, first and foremost, right? And so I'm going to the Ed Sullivan Theater. And I'm seeing my favorite American band doing, it's a sound check, right? It's a sound check. The song was Room at the Top of the World, right? It's an absolute stunning, beautiful song. The most killer guitaring ever for me, Mike. I mean, I, I never would want an SG in my life if, were it not for Mike Campbell and that record. And he's playing an SG all over. And I was like, I have to get one of those. <laughs> Um, but they, you know, it was interesting because they did, um, they did the song, sound check. Let's do it again. Let's get the levels. Let's do it again. Okay, now we need to get the cameras. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And we work on the lighting. They did it like, really, they played it seven times maybe, all the way through, start to finish. Every single time, it was just electricity just popping it just, it was everything was so good and so on and here i am you know me and one other and my friend the only people in the ed sullivan theater watching and afterwards we hopped up there and you know introduced ourselves to howie and you know hey how you doing man oh great yeah good to meet you and you know chatted with him for a minute he was a sweetheart and, uh, you know, Mike's right there. Tom's right there. It's, you know, I'm too much of a, not my, you know, I'm not going to insert myself. But, you know, how he's like, as they're starting to walk away, he's like, hey, man, come on back to the green room. And, you know, we knew. We knew the rules. And they ran a very tight ship at Letterman. And you could never go back. You know, so we were like, ah, thanks, man. We, that, we, we got stuff to do. Thanks so much. Whatever. And then uh, ended up seeing him. I don't remember if it was that week that they played Jones Beach, but they right around that time they played Jones Beach, and I went with the singer in my band. We went and and saw them. And it was fantastic. And the opening band was Lucinda Williams. It's Car Wheels on a Gravel Road, and the guitar player Kenny Vaughn. And I didn't know who he was. I'm like, who is that guitar player? Who? he's great and he's interesting, you know? And I don't know if, it, if, if I've got it right, but in my memory, he had like a Western, pink Western shirt with the sleeves cut off and these long skinny arms. I have skinny arms too. They're just not as long. Uh, and just playing all the coolest stuff and, you know, full circle again, you know? 15 years later, I'm standing there with him and Marty Stewart, and I'm showing him my guitar. And I'm like, God, this is weird. So I was making records uh, with New West, and it came time to make my second record. And I started working with John Hanlon, who was Neil Young's engineer. And it was all tape. Like, he was not interested in working on the record if we were going to use any Pro Tools or digital. It's like, it's got to be analog. So I was on board with that. And we ended up then having um, Don Smith come and mix some things, right? And uh, he was uh, working with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers a lot, and he was close with Mike Campbell. So he, he suggested, like, hey, I'll bring the two-inch tape over to Mike Campbell's house, who has a two-inch machine at his house, and uh, maybe get him to put on a little 12-string or something. And this song called Black Hearted Ways. And I... I was like, yeah, that sounds great. We're in Los Angeles. It seems like the right thing to do. I didn't, I didn't even attend the session. He gets up in the morning, brings the tape over to Mike Campbell's house. They put the 12-string guitar on it. I'm not even there. I'm not even out of bed yet, right? Mike Campbell on that day worked on my record after coffee in the morning. Then he went to work with Johnny Cash on the, and Rick Rubin. And then that night, they were in Sunset Sound. Uh, working on Tom Petty's uh, Echo record, right? So the Heartbreakers and Tom Petty are at Sunset Sound. I find this out. I go over to the studio. They let me in. I walk, start walking down the hallway. I hear Tom's voice come over the playback. That's I instantly get like, whoa, well, I'm, I'm at a session. You don't want to interrupt anybody's session. 
um, I got a little nervous. I'm like, oh, this is happening. I'm walking down the hallway at Sunset Sound. I hear Tom Petty's voice coming over playback, so I think they're in the control. They're doing it. Then I pass this doorway, and I look over, and Tom Petty is sitting at a table in front of the biggest pile of weed I'd ever seen in my life. And I'm like, so I just keep walking. I just keep keep walking. Okay, so that's clearly that's a tape playback that's happening. And uh, I just I quickly, I don't stop there. I keep going down the hallway. And I, I quickly encounter uh, Ben Montanch and, uh, and Mike Campbell. And I just, I see Mike Campbell and I say, hey, Mike, I'm, I'm Tim East. And I, uh, I just want to come over and thank you for, for putting on guitar on my track this morning. And he's like, oh, cool, man. And he's like, most, he's walking back towards the room where Tom is. And we, go, we all go in there. And the next thing I know, I'm in a very small room. Um, just like a bedroom sized room with Tom and the band. And I'm just kind of focusing on thanking Mike really and talking to him about tunes and stuff. And it's really brief. Tom just kind of was doing his thing and, you know, got up, you know, left the room to go back to work, which was what they were doing. They were working on a record. And I made that apology. Uh, <laughs> I made that, um, you know, thank you uh, really quick and just and moseyed on. I was really lucky to see Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers play at the San Diego State Amphitheater with Steve Earle opening. So Roscoe's in the band at that time. Roscoe's uh, in the Dukes and Steve Earle's band. So I got backstage passes. And I got ten row, you know, tenth row seats. Um, Howie was still playing bass. I mean, I see the greatest Tom Petty show from the tenth row of an amphitheater, and uh, and then go backstage and, and hang out again. I'm not there to bother Tom Petty, and um, but uh, all all I know is that the the year before he passed, I got to see him on my birthday uh, here in Nashville, and I went to that show. And my friends that got me in the show that had the tickets as a gift, they were backstage and they were talking with him, and he told them that he broke his hip, that he had, was playing with a broken hip. So I just remember at the time going, thinking about like that dedication to your, your big family of, you know, he's responsible for all those employees, you know, kind of like how I mean, Jerry Garcia might've felt the same way. They're responsible for this big family of employees. So they got to keep going, but you know, you're, you're obviously dealing with some opioids right there, you know, when you're, 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 so when he, when he did pass and I was on tour in Australia, when I, I heard it in bed, I heard the news come on and I kind of screamed and I was like, you know, it just shocked me. But then I was like, oh, yeah, he's probably, you know, on, on some pain meds. And that with like just the life of just traveling, it, just, it was kind of one of those really emotional things. Like, um, I don't think the average person thinks about a band like that. There's so many people yeah. counting on that for a job and the pressure of the artist to keep that going. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of health insurance and a lot of families and a lot of, a lot of mortgage payments to be made. And uh, man, God bless Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers that keep on playing music and being so positive. I mean, just what a cool story those guys are. And and uh, and yeah, that's that's the extent of my Tom Petty stories. I feel really lucky to just have crossed his path because of the Austin Chronicle column that I used to write. And South by Southwest started that brought a lot of industry to Austin. So finally, for the first time, I was being noticed by you know, people in the in the industry. And so I started doing a couple things for Spin, and one of them was Tom Petty. Uh, it was when he did the uh, Full Moon Fever record. I don't know, I just, it was his first solo record, and I, you know, flew to L.A., and I was mortified. The thing that's weird about being a music critic, there's no preparation for meeting your idols. There's not, there's no school for that. And so I'm like, I kept thinking, like, I'm on the airplane flight going, okay, seven hours from now, I'm going to be fucking talking to Tom Petty. I'm being in the same room with Tom Petty, asking him questions. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I have no idea. And you're thrust into this situation where it's like a, a, the worst blind date ever. You're terrified. They're bored. You're trying to get a cover story out of it. But Tom Petty had the greatest publicist. Uh, Mitch Schneider was his name. And Mitch, uh, he set everything up. He said, okay, you're going to meet Tom here. You're going to go to MCA Records first. You know, and Tom's going to meet you there. Then you're going to get in his black Corvette, and you're going to drive. He's going to take you all around the valley, because the album had a lot of references to San Fernando Valley. 
And then you're going to go to a record store, a music store, I mean, and he's going to play guitar and amps. He just set the whole thing up, and it was great. So that's how it worked out. And, you know, Tom was really droll. You know, he, he was really funny and stuff. But we, we uh, when we went to the music store, we, we met uh, Guns N' Roses were there. And this is before they really took off, and they were big Tom Petty fans. And so they, they uh, you know, uh, what do they call it in Nashville? They germed them. They germed Tom Petty. And so I got I got that in the story. It had some good color. And it worked out okay. There was a period where I did four four cover stories for Spin within about seven months. And the deal was is that I was the, I was a writer that didn't care if they were cool or not. So I, I did Bon Jovi cover story. The Bangles, uh, Edie Raquel, New Bohemian, New Bohemians. And Tom Petty actually, in, at that point, I think it was '89. He was on his down. He was on the down uh, downside. His previous record, "Help Me, Help Me Up, I've Had Enough" or something like that, it was a bomb. Didn't have any hits on it. He was considered too old for MTV. He was pretty much finished. And uh, then he met Jeff Lynne, and then got that restart on his career for that record. But I didn't. When I heard the record, I didn't think it was all that great. And then it became this huge hit. Shows what I know. Yeah, and that record really. That record really defined his the rest of his career. You know, Wildflowers. You know, she's the one. All that stuff was sort of like that, uh, more mid tempo. You know, droll stuff. Yeah, he he was he settled me down. You know, I think I I said I was so nervous to meet him, but he was so disarming. Uh, he when he went to MCA to meet me there. Everybody was like uh, beside themselves. They said, "We've never. He's never been to the label before. He's never been here before." And so that took a lot of pressure off me because I knew the publicists there, and they were kind of interacting with me and him and that sort of thing. So that it kind of broke the ice. And then also, he's in this. He's driving around in his in his Corvette, and that helps out a lot too because he's pointing out, "Oh, that see that shop over there, that bikini shop." That's where our old bass player works now. Uh, Ron, somebody, was, was working there. And so he's pointing stuff out, so that helps a lot. It, as far as the, the sitting down, you know, uh, next to, ne- you know, face-to-face, that, that stuff was, I was still pretty nervous. Did you see him back before the, at all, in the earlier days? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw him at uh, Santa Monica Civic. It was New Year's Eve. Uh, 1978 becomes 1979. And up to that point, it was the best rock and roll show I'd ever seen. Unbelievable. He he reminded me of Patti Smith. He was sort of a more of a punk type guy, uh, very overwrought, you know, emotionally. The band kicked ass. I mean, it was just I was I was blown away by him, you know. So I was really kind of in awe. 